Welcome back to Monitors Unbox. Today we're checking out MSI's Super Ultra Wide MPG 491 CQP, a massive 49 inch QD OLED monitor designed primarily for gaming. This is the third monitor I've tested now after the ASUS and Samsung models to use a 32 by 9 OLED panel, so it'll be interesting to see whether MSI's variant is the one to get. In terms of panel, what we're looking at here is a 49 inch 5120 by 1440 QD OLED with a maximum refresh rate of 144 Hz. It has an 1800R curvature and uses second generation QD OLED technology from Samsung Display. It ends up with the same refresh rate as ASUS's ROG Swift PG49WCD, but isn't able to reach the 240 Hz offered by the Samsung Odyssey OLED G9. It's a little surprising to see just 144Hz offered here given MSI first showed off this display as the Project 491C with a 240Hz refresh rate, but the actual release version seems to be using a slightly different panel variant with a lower refresh rate. While this monitor may seem ridiculously wide at first glance, it's actually the equivalent of two 27-inch 2560x1440 monitors side by side stitched together without a bezel in between. This offers an especially immersive experience for gaming and also the possibility of productivity work with side-by-side -side apps, though there's probably a few reasons why you wouldn't want to do that on this specific monitor. Anyway, these screens have been surprisingly popular among high-end buyers and seem especially well suited to applications like racing simulators where you'd want the extra width. Being so wide, you'll need quite a lot of desk space to accommodate the 491 CQP. It's around 1.2 meters wide, offering 40 centimeters of additional width versus a traditional 21 by 9 ultra wide, though it's not overly tall. Game support is pretty good these days for ultra wides, but 32 by 9 is less supported than 21 by 9 and 16 by 9, so you may run into titles that don't support this type of format without mods or hacks but the newer the game you're playing, the less likely this will be an issue in my experience. It is a curved monitor, though the curve is standard and not too aggressive at 1800R. I think this gives it a nice balance between bringing the edges in a bit for immersive gaming, while not distorting the image too much for desktop app usage. A flat panel of this width I don't think would be very good. The wider the screen, the more justifiable the curve is, especially at normal desk viewing distances. The 491 CQP is a standard affair when it comes to design. Most of the outer surfaces are constructed from plastic, the exception being the wide metal stand legs. Despite needing wide legs, the actual legs themselves are quite thin, so you should be able to place objects around the base of the monitor. The front, which is naturally dominated by the large wide screen, also features a chin along the bottom bezel, which you don't get with the Samsung variant. It's not a huge chin, but it doesn't look as nice as the OLED G9, which has a more uniform design. On the rear is MSI's take on the central box design we see with a lot of gaming OLEDs with a long rectangular vented box in the middle and the panel extending outwards from there. I think it looks fine, there's a variety of different textures of plastic being used, but I don't think it'll blow you away, it's a middle of the pack sort of build. The stand does support height tilt and swivel adjustment, though like other 49 inch monitors, the maximum height on offer is pretty short. Due to the size of the screen, it's also not the most sturdy construction going around, so expect a bit of wobble if you accidentally bump the monitor. For port selection, we get one display port 1.4, two HDMI 2.1 48 gigabits per second ports, and a USB-C port supporting DP alt mode and 90 watts of power delivery. In addition, there's a two port USB 2.0 hub and a headphone jack. Like a lot of recent MSI monitors, KVM functionality is included, and while you can utilize the full 144Hz refresh rate over both DisplayPort and HDMI, DSC is used for DisplayPort. The OSD is controlled through a directional toggle on the rear of the display, just behind the power LED. Inside you'll find MSI's typical range of features, which includes gaming-specific stuff like crosshairs, a refresh rate counter, and a black boosting, along with a variety of color controls. There's nothing overly unique in here, but it has the features most people would be after. Samsung's second generation of QD OLED panels do provide some improvements to the issues we highlighted in our initial QD OLED ultrawide monitor reviews, chiefly around the subpixel structure. While this QD OLED panel still uses a triangle RGB layout, the sizing of the subpixels has been adjusted, which slightly improves text clarity relative to first gen QD OLED. There is still some pink green fringing at the top and bottom of text, but it's not quite as noticeable as with first gen panels, enough to say it's been improved without being fully fixed. However, the degree to which it has been improved is not nearly as significant as with the latest 4K QD OLED panels, which feature a much higher pixel density. 
With those first gen ultra wide panels, I was one of the reviewers that found the text fringing issue more noticeable and more annoying with desktop app usage. There were certainly others that didn't think it was a big deal at all. With the second gen QD OLED design, I think it edges closer into the acceptable range. It's still not as good as a similar pixel density LCD that uses an RGB stripe subpixel layout, but typically it's reasonable enough for occasional desktop app usage and continues to be a non-issue for content consumption like gaming. On top of this, I believe the text clarity of second gen QD OLED is much better than similar W OLED panels, so of the two main OLED technologies, I would choose QD OLED for anything text heavy. Unfortunately though, the screen composition, layer structure and coding has only received minor improvements relative to first gen QD OLED. This second gen panel is still glossy and still has issues reflecting ambient light when light sources are in front of the display. The reflection handling itself is reasonable, so you won't always notice those horrible mirror-like reflections in bright usage environments, but the layer structure to this panel still reflects far too much ambient light. If your environment isn't well optimized, this ambient light reflection makes the panel appear gray even when attempting to display pure black, which reduces the quality of the deep, rich blacks that OLED is known for. Now the second gen design does reflect a bit less ambient light relative to first gen QD OLED, but the improvement is not enough to be considered a fix. I don't really think it's close in my opinion. So the same thoughts I have in regards to screen composition and coding apply to the 491 CQP as previous QD OLEDs. In a standard indoor viewing environment with artificial light or plenty of sunlight, QD OLED isn't ideal due to its issues with reflecting ambient light and raising blacks. This ambient reflectivity is exacerbated when there's more light in front of the panel, but isn't as problematic when lighting is only behind the display and it's a non-issue in dimly lit or dark rooms. In contrast, glossy LG W OLED panels typically appear blacker when faced with a bright usage environment and its panel structure rejects more ambient light. It's really hard to say whether this will be an issue for you as it can be a case-by-case -case basis. Personally, I do find it annoying and one of the larger issues with QD OLED panels, but if you primarily game at night, it's not anywhere near as much of a concern. At the very least, it's something to be aware of. What's also important to be aware of is that OLEDs generally aren't great monitors for desktop usage, productivity apps, and web browsing because they are susceptible to permanent burn-in. Anything with static content like toolbars or icons on screen for a long period of time, like you get with desktop apps, is at risk of burning in. Conversely, dynamic content like gaming or watching videos is at practically no risk of burn in. So don't worry about this if you're primarily using an OLED for gaming. Even the occasional bit of desktop app usage is fine. It's more eight hours a day of productivity work that may lead to burn in. Where MSI is able to separate themselves a bit from the pack is their three year burn in warranty and OLED Care 2.0 features. Most monitors have built-in burn-in protection features like auto-dimming and pixel shifting, but MSI's take has the most customizability and control. Some of the more advanced features like taskbar detection are unfortunately unable to be used with Adaptive Sync enabled, even in the latest version 0.13 firmware, but on other products I haven't found them especially useful. It's more the ability to control how aggressive the pixel shifting and dimming features are that I find handy. In terms of response time performance, it's no surprise to see this QD OLED panel offering lightning fast speeds similar to other QD OLEDs we've tested. At its maximum 144Hz refresh rate, we're seeing a 0.4 to 0.5 millisecond average response, which is extremely fast and that leads to very clear motion for this sort of refresh rate. With no noticeable inverse ghosting, the MSI model is on par with the other variants for motion clarity and far superior to any LCD at the same refresh rate. The only downside here is it capping out at 144Hz instead of 175 or 240Hz like we've seen from other QD OLEDs. The best part of how OLEDs function is that performance is basically identical at all refresh rates. This means whether we're testing at 144 or 60Hz, we're still seeing about a 0.45 millisecond response time average. LCDs typically get slower as the refresh rate decreases, but this isn't the case here. So the 491 CQP offers a single overdrive mode experience without any overdrive settings, of course, as they aren't required for an OLED. There is effectively no difference in response time performance between this QD OLED and other OLED monitors. The only difference for motion clarity at the maximum refresh rate is the max refresh itself. The 240Hz monitors in this chart, like the Samsung OLED G9, do have superior clarity as there's less sample and hold motion blur at higher refresh rates like 240Hz. I was mildly interested to see that both the ASUS and MSI models are slightly slower than the other OLEDs by about 0.1 milliseconds, but this makes absolutely no difference to the end result you see. 
Where the big difference lies is between OLED and LCD. This MSI model is much faster than the fastest LCD I've tested, which is a big win for OLED, and it only gets better when looking at average performance. While LCDs do get a bit slower at lower refresh rates, OLEDs don't, so the gap between OLED and LCD grows. Here the MSI model is around 10 times faster than some of the highest end LCDs on the market today. It's also good to confirm excellent cumulative deviation results, though no different from most other OLEDs. As expected, this really is the same technology that delivers the same response time performance as other QD OLED ultrawides. Input latency is great, identical to the ASUS PG49WCD at around a 0.7 millisecond processing delay. The refresh rate is only middling here though, 144Hz isn't especially fast these days when there are 240Hz variants using the same panel format, so total latency relative to the Samsung OLED G9 is a bit higher due to higher refresh lag. This does make the Samsung model feel quicker to use, though in gaming you'll only see the benefits if you are planning to utilize frame rates above 144fps. Power consumption, it's on the high side when displaying a full white image as you might expect from a display this large, however it's very similar to what we saw from the ASUS PG49WCD. The Samsung model still consumes significantly more power to display the same input, which is interesting. I'm guessing that has to do with the higher refresh rate and smart TV processor. The 491 CQP, as expected for a QD OLED, is a wide gamut display with 99% DCI-P3 coverage. We're also seeing 99% coverage of Adobe RGB, so work in either of those color spaces is going to be good. This leaves us with 85% coverage of Rec 2020, which is one of the strongest showings from modern displays, though no different to other super ultra-wide QD OLEDs as the panel technology is fundamentally the same. Factory calibration is decent, with a pretty good color temperature and delta E average for grayscale out of the box. However, like most gaming monitors, there's no sRGB clamp enabled by default, so most SDR content will be oversaturated by default. This leads to mediocre saturation and color checker delta E's, and you're most likely to notice this in skin tones, which will appear redder than natural. Compared to other monitors, factory grayscale calibration is pretty good, not quite as good as the ASUS model, but significantly better than the Samsung model. Due to oversaturation issues, none of the models have especially compelling factory color checker results. MSI do provide an sRGB mode, though enabling it will lock you out of some settings such as white balance controls. With that said, the mode is reasonably well calibrated with improved grayscale performance compared to the default configuration and effective sRGB color space emulation. This is a really usable mode that performs well. Compared to other monitors, the MSI model once again performs pretty well for sRGB mode calibration, though the ASUS model is slightly ahead. This is also the case for Color Checker, though I'd say both the ASUS and MSI models provide decent calibration results that are highly usable. The Samsung model can also be improved quite a bit, though not to the degree of the other variants given it was coming from a much worse position. Calibrated performance as expected is excellent and we use CalMan for this. The wide color gamut that gives near full coverage of several key color spaces is key to delivering very accurate results most of the time, although the dynamic nature of OLED panels means there is a small amount of variance at times, more than we'd see from an LCD. Nevertheless, you can achieve great results on a product like this. We're seeing very similar results for maximum brightness across all the QD OLED panels we've tested, and the 491 CQP is no exception. At 265 nits, the MSI model is around the ballpark of other models, which also slightly exceed 250 nits. By default, MSI opt for a uniform brightness configuration in the STR mode, which prevents any annoying automatic brightness limiter behavior when using desktop apps, which is the right choice. Minimum brightness is solid at 33 nits, though this is higher than the ASUS model. Viewing angles are outstanding from QD OLED panels, so you won't have any issues with color shifting or tint when viewed from off angles. The only concern here would be the curve reducing the visibility of the entire screen, though 1800R is good for gaming at this sort of size and ultra-wide aspect ratio. Uniformity was great as well, continuing a trend of these QD OLED panels delivering a nice and consistent experience. The only slight issues we noticed were in the corners, but even then, this is hard to notice in practice. This MSI monitor is a great HDR display. This is due to OLED technology's inherent hardware qualities that are tailor-made for displaying HDR content. The key feature here is that each individual pixel is self-lit, meaning at a pixel level the display can turn on or off to accurately display everything from dark shadows to bright highlights. When the display needs to show pure black, it can fully switch off, giving us the trademark rich zero-level blacks and deep shadows that OLED is known for. This is in contrast to most HDR-capable LCD panels, which are not fully controllable at the pixel level. LCDs require a backlight, and for HDR displays, this typically means the use of full array local dimming, a technology that splits the backlight into zones. 
whereas OLED can turn off each pixel individually, LCDs with local dimming can only turn off certain zones, encompassing hundreds or even thousands of pixels. This can still be effective for HDR content and look great, but it has some fundamental flaws in difficult circumstances. For example, when showing a bright and dark element close together, an OLED can control each pixel as needed with a clean, accurate distinction between bright and dark. LCDs with local dimming need to masterfully control the zones to achieve the necessary distinction between bright and dark, and when the element is too small or not in the optimal position, the bright element can spill into the dark area within the backlight zone, creating ugly blooming artifacts. OLED therefore has the edge when it comes to displaying clean HDR content with minimal blooming or haloing. In some scenes this will be the difference between raised blacks and deep blacks, such as for starfields and Christmas lights. At other times, OLED can have a brightness advantage for small bright objects within a dark scene. Subtitles will look cleaner on an OLED with reduced blooming, and generally, OLEDs produce richer shadows thanks to its inherently high contrast ratio. Aside from brightness and shadow detail, OLEDs also have other advantages for HDR. As there are no backlight zones, OLEDs are faster to transition between bright and dark with no visible zone transitions. OLEDs are much less likely to suffer from backlight flickering, although light PWM behavior, especially when using a variable refresh rate, is common, and OLEDs like this one do not increase input latency in its HDR mode as they don't need to run a backlight zone algorithm. When it comes to HDR configurations, the 491 CQP comes with two modes, True Black 400 and Peak 1000 nits. This is similar to most other QD OLED gaming monitors. The True Black mode has the best EOTF tracking with very tight adherence to the correct curve across a variety of window sizes, including 10%, 2%, and 25%. However, the downside here is this mode is limited to just over 450 nits, which isn't that bright and lacks punch for the very brightest highlights. This lack of brightness punch is especially noticeable in dark scenes with bright lights or when viewing elements like the sun in a daylight scene. The peak mode has decent EOTF tracking at 10% and 2% window sizes, with confirmation here that smaller window sizes can exceed 1000 nits of peak brightness. However, like with most QD OLED monitors, the peak mode suffers from poor accuracy at higher window sizes like 25%, lowering brightness in the mid-range. This seems to like an unnecessary trade-off and probably should be fixed. In real scenes, this sort of accuracy lowers brightness when the overall image has a mid to high APL and elements are above a certain level of brightness. One common example would be the sky in a daytime scene, although shadow detail in that same scene is unaffected. Recently, there's been some discussion about whether the true black or peak modes are better on these sorts of monitors. This ultimately comes down to whether you prefer higher mid-range brightness in higher APL scenes or higher peak brightness in lower APL scenes. Having now used QD OLEDs for quite a while, my personal preference remains with the peak mode. However, you may have a different opinion there. There certainly seems to be that opinion out there. And you could, of course, choose to use the true black mode instead if you find that the higher mid-range brightness is something that you prefer. MSI and other manufacturers should look to fix the peak mode so there isn't an issue with higher APL scenes and so we can get the best of both worlds. When it comes to HDR brightness using the peak mode, the 491 CQP has the exact same characteristics we've seen from other QD OLED gaming monitors. About 270 nits full screen, about 480 nits at a 10% window size, and a little over 1000 nits at a 2% window size. Brightness versus window tracking is identical to other products using the same variant of this panel. Real world brightness is decent, though there's nothing groundbreaking to share here. It performs exactly as expected. There isn't anything separating this variant from the other 49 inch models, so ultimately you can expect a very similar experience in real world videos or games from the various models. Final section of this review is the Hub Essentials Checklist 2.0. In this first part, we're looking to see whether MSI are accurately advertising their monitor, and for the most part, they are. Response time numbers are a bit misleading, although that's reasonably common, while other specs are accurately portrayed. Unfortunately, MSI do not seem to provide an HDR brightness spec, although we know that to be around 1000 nits peak. Then next we have the feature support matrix, where it's no surprise to see an OLED performing well in the contrast and motion sections. The biggest wins for MSI here are the inclusion of USB-C with adequate power delivery, a KVM switch, a 3-year burn-in warranty, and user upgradable firmware. The main misses are areas like not including a 240Hz refresh rate, the locked sRGB mode, and lack of Dolby Vision support. Overall, the MSI MPG 491 CQP is certainly a decent gaming monitor. It's large, it's super wide, it performs well, and it provides the usual benefits we see from QD OLED technology. Given its size, it may have somewhat of a limited appeal, but there are plenty of use cases for a dual 1440p setup, particularly for immersive gaming and simulator rigs. 
The general performance that we see here isn't all that different from other QD OLEDs I've tested, including the other 49 inch models. The good news is this level of performance is quite strong. Motion performance, for example, is great due to its lightning fast response times, while color performance is excellent thanks to a very wide color gamut, elite viewing angles, and deep zero level blacks. The primary audience for a product like this is someone that wants an immersive monitor for HDR single player gaming, and I think MSI deliver here. The HDR capabilities of these QD OLED panels is excellent with per pixel local dimming and brightness capabilities up to the 1000 nit range. Now there's just even more width and the resolution requirements aren't ridiculous with the total pixel count similar to 4K. The second gen QD OLED panel has slightly improved text clarity relative to most 34 inch ultra wide QD OLEDs thanks to an adjusted subpixel structure, although other typical issues remain. The panel structure still reflects ambient light in some situations, reducing the apparent black depth. There's also the ever-present risk of permanent burn-in using a monitor like this for desktop productivity work, which does hamper the usability of this form factor somewhat. 49 inch 5120 x 1440x1440 is equivalent to two 27 inch 1440p monitors side by side, which would be a nice configuration for side by side app usage, but at the moment I can only recommend that as an occasional secondary use case. As a content consumption and gaming monitor though, this really does deliver a great experience. Where the MSI model stumbles is pretty similar to where the ASUS PG49WCD stumbles, the refresh rate. Going for a 144Hz configuration with a premium product like the 491 CQP makes little sense when competitors like Samsung are offering up to 240Hz. All the other features are there, except that refresh rate you get on competitors, and the difference here is significant enough to be noticed in both motion clarity and responsiveness. This makes the 491 CQP harder to recommend compared to the Samsung Odyssey OLED G9, even though in some areas the MSI model outperforms the G9, like factory calibration or offering a proper burn -in warranty. I feel like most people spending over $1,000 US on their gaming display will want to pay for the best of the best hardware, not something with reduced capabilities. Where things currently stand, MSI are offering the 491 CQP for $1,100 US, which isn't significant enough of a discount compared to Samsung's variant. The pricing of the OLED G9 jumps around a bit, with its MSRP of $1,800 being extremely hard to justify, but there are regular sales to be had, and the price just keeps getting lower. A couple of months ago, it was discounted to $1,300, then $1,200. And these days it's not uncommon to see sales down at $1100, the exact same price as the MSI variant. In my opinion, the MSI model, or any 144Hz variant really, needs to be notably cheaper than the Samsung model for it to be worth purchasing. Of course, pricing may vary in different regions, so ideally I want to see around a 15-20% to discount to go with the MSI model. Again, it's not a bad product, in fact in a lot of areas it performs well, but premium products come with premium expectations on both performance and features. So anyway, that's it for this review. Yes, another OLED monitor review. There's been a lot of them lately. There's been so many releases to cover. So yeah, plenty of OLED content right here on Monitors Unboxed. Anyway, if you do support, want to support the channel, if you enjoy our content, you want to support our testing here, then the best way to do that, just subscribe, like, do all that sort of stuff. But also we have our Patreon and Floatplane accounts. Links to those are in the description below. If you want to sign up and you'll gain access to some cool benefits like our Discord community, the ICC profiles and calibration settings that we use throughout these reviews and all sorts of those things. So yeah, it's a really great place to just support the work that we do here at Monitors Unbox. So thanks for watching and I'll catch you in the next one.